Ich bin nicht da. Like the offhand, I was not trying to go fast. I'm trying to connect. I, honestly, with the 1911, I'm not that good. Not yet. Me I either. I don't shoot them a whole lot. I'll get good with it. Middle plate. Far plate. Hey 1911 fans, if you're looking for a high quality, reliable, accurate, relatively high value, and lightweight 1911 handgun, then the American-made Smith & Wesson 1911 PD series are some of the best in the world, at least as of 2010. Proven and highly recommended by me, Nut & Fancy, here in the Nut & Fancy Project, TMP for short. Hello world, welcome if you have found this video through a Google search or something like that, glad to have you. A special welcome to my thousands of friends and fans across the world, we call them TMPers, whose enthusiastic support makes all the work putting a video together like this fun and worthwhile for me. You guys rock, thanks so much. 1911s in the Nut and Fancy Project, specifically PD Series by Smith. Uh, I'm enthusiastic about the type after much testing. Some guys may ask, so how did you arrive at this one as your next tested and subsequently recommended 1911? Good question. And it begins with my review, previously done in the project, of the Taurus PT1911. Still a recommended, high value, great 1911 option. Uh, we have, uh, heck, thousands of rounds for this one at this point. It's been a great gun for the Nut and Fancy clan. We have no intentions of getting rid of it. However, it's not perfect, and some 1911 enthusiasts may not be satisfied with Taurus levels of quality. Maybe it's the fit and finish, the choice of materials for different components. They just may not dig it. Okay, and you can see even on ours, I've done some component upgrading. There's a Wilson Combat Safety, Wilson Combat Hammer, fitted along with a trigger job by Yoda. That is Terry G from Impact Guns, did a great job, and then I Duracoated it in the colors you'll see annotated modified to make it, I don't know, more pleasing to us. And by the way, wearing the Ergo grips in Coyote Tan. Great gun. But it's not the highest quality lightweight 1911 out there. And again, if I didn't say it, it's a PT-1911 AL. This is the aluminum frame Taurus, non-railed. So after I finished this review, I came away saying, well, you know, what if I were to go out on a quest to find a, the next step up in quality from the Taurus? Still a lightweight 1911. Because when I go out hunting, the POU which predominates for me is a go to war gun. Follow okay, if you that. don't know what I'm talking about, reference my 19 my 1911 philosophy of use video. And that's going to be important and foundational to this video because it covers in depth the first three talking points. Like ish. Revised specifically for the 1911 handgun review. Wow, nothing fancy, there's a lot on there. I know. When you talk about 1911s, if you're going to do a good review, thorough, in-depth, and comprehensive, and by the way, this will be the most comprehensive review in the world on these guns, I can pretty much guarantee you that, then you got to get into the detail, or the details. That's uh, what makes the difference in value and pricing. I mean, you can get a 1911 that looks just like this one. Maybe it's, I don't know, from Nighthawk Custom or STI, whatever. Put it on the table, and it'll be three times the price, maybe even more. And you have to ask yourself, as an objective buyer, what constitutes the price difference? 
Well, I don't know if anything constitutes three times the price when you're talking about a handgun. And actually, when I go above the $1,000 price mark for any handgun, I become very unenthusiastic. I won't say I will never do that. There are, there are always exceptions. But I have an issue with it, you know, because then I get into the realm of, as a buyer, I say, well, there's $1,000. And by the way, I'm kind of jumping down to the value talk, talking point a little bit. There's $1,000 I can spend. I mean, I could, you know, if... I could spend that money on a tactical carbine, you know, loadout equipment, knives, flashlights, other things that my systems require. So you got to look at it, you know, pretty objectively and hardcore. And that's what I do as an objective, an independent reviewer. I want high value. So when I left the Taurus PT-1911, I went out on a quest. You know, what can I find out there that's better, higher quality? You're looking at it, Smith & Wesson 1911 PD. And yes... I did a lot of research. I'm talking, went to all the other brands, Les Bear, Wilson Combat, Pair Ordnance. A lot of these are custom, semi-custom, very expensive, I know. Kimber, they have a lot of great guns. Colt, Springfield, another favorite of mine. Sig, Ed Brown, Nighthawk Custom, STI, Rock River Arms, and on and on it went. My goal, lightweight, go-to-war gun that has a rail, 1911. Smith & Wesson, PD, there you have it. Not aluminum, but scandium frame. I'll talk about that here in a second. Let's jump into the, P, uh, the talking points. There's so much to discuss. Yes, the video's gonna go long. If you don't like it, stop watching. Unsubscribe, see ya, thanks for the memories. However, however, if you like, I don't know, Net and Fancy Gun TV, come along for the ride, it's gonna be fun. In fact, the stuff I'll say here in this review you could probably take with you on your next 1911 purchase, whatever kind it is. I'll make you I'll maybe make you think about some things in your shopping process uh, to score a better deal, maybe a higher quality. Let's get going. First three talking points again are contained in the 19 philosophy, 1911 philosophy of use video. Philosophy of use, size, weight, firepower, magazine type. I do have to make a few additions though. Like I said, POU for the 1911 PD for me in this gun, the full size one is a go-to-war gun. Incidentally, the model number on this black one, good looking gun by the way, model 108293, subject to change. All things are subject to change. As years go by, Smith & Wesson can, can, Smith & Wesson can discontinue, change the model numbers, you know how that goes. Model number 108296, commander size, that is four and a quarter inch barrel, scanning frame 1911. The POUs I think are a little bit different. Concealed carry gun perhaps, full size go-to-war gun, Yes, a lot of other POUs, look at the video. Recreational, competitive, home defense, all the stuff I said in the vid. They still play. Primarily for me though, go to war gun. That's why I gravitate towards the lightweight frames. Okay, weight specifically 33.4 ounces. That's with an empty magazine, 29 ounces. Those are lightweight 1911s. They can integrate into a wide variety of systems without weighing you down too much. Remember, you're carrying a lot of other stuff that comes along for the ride. The size is apparent, ah. full size, commander size. Excuse me, firepower, eight rounds, and they come with, the best nice. I can tell, a Metgar Italian produced magazine. You can see right there on the magazine body, made in Italy, I think, ah, uh, there it is somewhere. So much reflection, hard to see. There you go. And if you compare it against this Metgar magazine, which is labeled as Metgar, you can see that there's a lot of similarities. The finish the same, the welding is a little bit different, not much. The followers are different. The Metgar has a plastic follower, stainless steel follower in the Smith & Wesson proprietary. And yes, it's marked somewhere along here with the Smith & Wesson logo. This is another reason I like wearing gloves so I don't I get moisture all over the device. See, like that. One thing you wanna watch, this is something I found in testing of the Smith & Wesson magazine is really make sure this base plate is snapped. Several times I saw this just kind of walk off because this button wasn't snapped correctly and it never came off, but I just saw some air in here. I've never seen that problem with the Metgar branded magazines. Eight rounders, I didn't have any issues with them that I can detect. Uh, the plot thickens here in a second, I'll tell you what I'm talking about. Other magazines tested in the gun, Chip McCormick, Power Mag Plus, also the Kimber 10 rounder, and then in Sadly Missing's gun, the Wilson Combat steel floor plate right there. Great magazines, all of them. Incidentally, some guys, quick mini review on the Chip McCormick Power Mag Plus. Some guys, I think, may complain about it. I think you're confusing the earlier Chip McCormicks. The Power Mag Plus actually have a redesigned 
follower system that's better contained within the magazine tube body. And that way it doesn't pop forward when it does last shot hold open and that follower smack your softer frame, whether it's scanium or aluminum, it can ding it up. The Power Mag Plus, my understanding, was made specifically to solve that problem. Okay, it cannot make contact with the receiver is what Chip McCormick says. I found that to be pretty much the case. However, on the frame of the 1911 PD-108293, this one right here, there is a little bit of scratching right below the feed ramp. I'll see if I can roll in a picture. I don't think it was from this magazine. I just think it's from a lot of magazine insertions, which is, I think, normal wear and tear, right? Eight rounds, though, and I like how Smith does that. Great job. That's the firepower. Size and weight stuff. On to the crux of the review. Quality and features of the Smith & Wesson 1911 PD series. The heart and soul of this tabletop review. Going over all these features and an overall take on the quality. Why is that important? Because it shows you what you're getting for your money. And establishes an overall value level for the PD model which you choose. Useful if you're going to compare it against competition. But you might want to keep this in mind. I might have said it in other videos. Nothing fancy philosophy alert. Here it comes. Just like a lot of things I throw on the reviewing table, the price to quality ratios are not exactly linear. This is quality, this is price. In other words, if I pay twice the price of this PD model, I'm way up here, am I getting twice the handgun in terms of reliability, accuracy, durability, and ergonomics? Probably not. I might get a slight increase. Let's just say 20%, if that but I paid twice the price, maybe even triple the price. Okay, and I'm talking about measurable first type of cool attributes, the stuff I just talked about. It happens in the 1911 world, it happens in the knife community and other handguns, other guns as well. Uh, it just is not linear. Keep in mind that the PD series is a mid-quality 1911 handgun, and yet you're getting high quality first type of cool performance in most cases. We'll talk about that as we go along. But quality and features are very important because it establishes value and price levels. You know, slight changes in all this stuff might double the cost of the handgun. It just does in the 1911 world. For instance, there's some features that guys may really, really want that are absent on the PD series. But do they affect first type of cool performance capabilities? Probably not. To a, I'm talking a measurable degree. For instance, how about a flush cut crown? Muzzle end. Will that, you know, change it? I don't know. Maybe slight increases. Absent on the PD. Counter sunk slide stop in the frame. You know, it's protruding out there the opposite side. Does that affect performance? No, not really. You know, I don't know. Maybe if you're resting your hand there and it bugs you. Okay, you can make that argument, I guess. Any chamfering or special milling on the slide itself? Uh, I mean, we'll talk about slide in a sec, but most of it's lacking. Okay, it's pretty standard. There's no melt job done on the PD series. You may not like that. There's no 40 lines per inch rear slide milling, which are on some very high end 1911s. And actually I dig it. I think that's cool. How useful is it? Eh. Marginally maybe. There's no top of slide milling on the PD series either. And I could go on and on of all the things perhaps that are not in the PD series, but don't really directly affect its performance when you're measuring the stuff that really, really counts. And what really, really counts is rounds on target, just like I said in the 1911 POU video. Okay, so here we go. Features, starting off with finish. This one, Model 108-293, wears a very handsome, perfectly applied black melanite finish. Look at this. And this is after many holster presentations and wear and tear in the testing and evaluation. I don't see any really measurable you know, wear on that finish. Smith & Wesson says it's it's about 68 on the hardness level. That is Rockwell scale. And in my testing, I think that's a true statement. Good looking too. I like it on this gun, on this 1911. Yes, I know some TMPers out there will go, well, nothing fancy. We thought you'd get tired of black handguns. I do. And it really depends on the philosophy of use that I'm going to throw that gun into. So, uh, perhaps I want a gun that's more camo. And a black handgun is not... A really a smart choice in that particular POU. You know, witness sadly missing 108296. In other words, it's commander size PD. Coated again, Black Hawk Coyote Tan after bead blasting. Good looking, don't you think? 
useful too in certain POUs where it blends in. I mean, you might want to put on camel grips if that's what you're going for. I think he's just after looks mostly. But that's a custom job. It did not come out of the box that way. Okay, and if you don't like the black color or if you don't like the stock color of your 108296 shown here in the catalog, change it. You know, missionspeccamel.com. By the way, hearing very good reports from TM Peers on their Duracoat jobs you're getting back. They love it. Change the color. Easy. Duracoat, maybe even Cerakote, but that's a little harder. Uh, and the colors are not quite as versatile. And it's harder to refinish with Cerakote, my understanding. May do that in the future. We'll see. I love the black metal knight finish on this gun. Authoritative, hard wearing, awesome. Let's go on to frame. Scandium is a material used in the PD series. And I've learned a little bit about scandium of late due to my research. For one, did you know that it is, from my information, twice as strong as aluminum? Specifically, what is it, 6061 and 7005 series aluminum. Whoa! I mean, that's pretty good. That's kind of like AR-15 receiver aluminum, which is strong. Scandium's twice as strong as that. And more importantly, it has give. Okay, it has some um, flex to it, which might be a good thing. That means less frame cracks. I learned this not in the gun world, but in the bike world, where some high-end manufacturers are using scandium for their mountain bike frames. Going away from the harsh aluminum that's you know doesn't soak up shock, doesn't have the flex that the chrome moly steel did, and they're going into scandium, which is lighter weight, twice as strong as aluminum, and it has a, uh, I don't know, a more comfortable ride to it with or without suspension. And I think that plays in the handgun world as well. And I talked to Smith & Wesson about it, and they say, yeah, we're very happy with our Scanium choices. This is not just this gun, this revolvers too that Smith uses. I didn't know all that stuff. I think that's cool. So tough wearing, won't crack on you, and it's really lightweight. Great choice of frame material. Oh, let me mention this, by the way. And we're talking about the frame and the melanite finish. No wear on the exterior, but expect to see some wear on the slide rails. Not going to break the handgun down right now, just for time reasons. I'll throw a picture in, but the melanite will will wear off on the frame, and that's absolutely normal, as a slide mates to the frame. What you might want to do, however, is keep that area clean. You don't want to allow a lot of grit between the scanium frame and the forged hardened slide, because that can accelerate wear. You with me? But don't freak out when you see that black wearing off. Absolutely normal. Uh, the frame, by the way, let's talk about other details. For instance, the rail. I love that on the 108293, and it is a huge reason I sought it out. Look at the precision of the CNC milling job on this and how low profile that rail is. Great to have a rail on your 1911. Not so great if it can't do this. Fit in a non-railed holster. This is a standard Blackhawk Serpa holster, not meant for a 1911 rail, and the PD fits. To me, that's a rail done right. Compact, low profile, and also it has multiple grooves in it. I don't like 1911s that just have one groove in it. Maybe I want to move my light forward or aft, you know, and the light I'm talking about. I don't even know if I have it here. I'll roll a picture in. TLR3, previously reviewed, highly recommended in the Nut and Fancy project. You know, with three grooves, you can move it forward and aft as you see fit you know, to adjust your hand size because you're going to actuate it probably with your index finger on that particular light model. By the way, it rides perfectly on this gun. Excellent. I love having a light capability on the 1911. Again, that expands into different POUs. Home defense, I think it's mandatory. Recreational shooting, shooting steel plates out in the desert at night. Fun, fun, fun. And it's also great training for pretty much any other POU. You know, shop around, by the way, for lightweight railed 1911s and tell me in the comments what you come up with. There's not many out there as of 2010. Fortunately, the PD is so well executed, not a huge deal. High cut under the trigger guard for a higher handhold. I like that. Here's the front strap. Lacking, I don't know, full on checkering, and I kind of like that. After all the shooting I've done on this model, I don't miss it. Let me break out another model of 1911 by Smith & Wesson, currently in the Nut & Fancy project. You may see more of this in the future. Here comes a uh, model, what is this? Make sure I get the number right. Last three are 011 Pro Series. Front strap is checkered, 30 lines per inch, and you can see it kind of bulges out from the front frame. I don't dig that so much. I wish they would have kind of left it flush. Still checker it, but leave it flush. Don't raise it out. To me, it just has, I don't know, a little bit bulged out feel to it. Minor, minor, and I haven't shot this gun yet, so. 
I'll really know when I shoot it. I don't miss the checkering so far in this model of 1911. And some guys find it downright obnoxious. In other words, it just gets in the way, it braids their hand. Here's the rear mainspring housing. That's really not part of the frame. It's also checkered. Uh, other frame details, I told you it's not countersunk there. Overall, nicely executed, very lightweight though. That Scanium is an excellent choice. There's two major forged stainless steel components on the Smith PDs. First one is the barrel. Not match grade quality, and a standard barrel bushing by the way, but it gets the job done, as you will see under accuracy. The second component is a slide. Also forged stainless steel, hidden by the finishes of the gun. And the 108293, the black melanite. That's a stainless steel forged slide. Pretty cool. Also, it's milled for standard Novak sights. In fact, these are Novak sights. Uh, that's a big plus in my book because if you don't like the sights, there you have some options available to you with that milling. You know, I like the Heine straight eights myself. I think they're cool. With the 1911s, I like a nice, clean, precise sight picture. I don't really mind these. Combat three dots are okay, and they worked very well in the practical shooting we did in testing. Um, but I like a little bit more precision, mainly in the POU of recreation and maybe competition, oh, running guns, shooting steel plates for time, that's kind of stuff. Uh, grasping grooves, forward, uh, forward and aft. I know, why do they put these up here? I think it's mostly aesthetic. I do not recommend with a 1911 or any handgun to put your hand up here because perhaps under stress, especially with a light single action trigger, safety off, you may just accidentally pull that trigger with your hand up here. Lose a finger. It's happened before and I've heard about it from TMPers, so be careful. Uh, other things of the slide. Oh, here we go. A deviation from the John Browning formula. That's an external extractor. I know, we could do a whole video on the pros and cons of external versus internal. What do I think? I just want it to be reliable and durable. I don't care if it's internal or external, really. But if you press me hard, I would say, uh, I kind of prefer the external extractor. I know Kimber had some issues, went back to the internal, maybe a metal, uh, metallurgy issue with them, a marketing issue. I think though the Smith & Wesson design has it right, but that is a deviation from the John Browning formula if you don't like it, I don't know, maybe that's not the gun for you. I think the internal extractor on some 1911 designs is actually more prone to failure. You know, it's a piece of spring steel that can fatigue and set, whereas maybe, just maybe, the external extractor will last a little bit longer. And actually, John Moses Browning designed the external extractor on the high power after he did the 1911 design. I'm just saying. Okay, I know your mileage may vary, whatever. Uh, talked about the sights. The safety lever on the PDs is kind of a miss. I got a cruise, there's so much to talk about. Sharp edges on this Ambi safety. I'm not sure who their vendor is. Smith & Wesson bought this one. I'm not sure who made it for them. I don't like it though. I don't really need an ambi safety. Yes, we do offhand shooting drills in TMP, and in that POU, it's useful to put your safety on when you're done and you're running. Um, but sharp edge right here. In fact, I had to break it. I milled it off with a file, sanded it, and cold blued it. You can see it through the wear and tear uh, testing the gun. It's worn off. Don't like that safety. Much better is this one. And by the way, this is sadly Missing's gun, and he totally milled that. But these are two different brands of safeties. These are not the same. You can see it's single-sided, but he still chamfered that, milled it. Nice job, sadly, on that, and this is much more comfortable. That's an easy fix, though. You can throw another one on. It is a miss, though. I got to tell you, it's a miss. And some guys will say, what parts are metal injection molded on the PD series? Let me see if I can remember. The slide stop it MIM. Disconnector and sear or MIM is what Smith & Wesson told me. The rest is either, either uh, milled from Bart's stock or forged. And MIM, I don't think, is the end of the world. It's hard as glass, a MIMed part is. The really, from what I can detect, the only disadvantage is if you need to gunsmith it, it's much more difficult. They don't respond to filing. You're going to have to stone it and polish it, and that might take some more work. Just something to keep in mind. So MIM, not the end of the world. There are some MIM parts in there. The rest, pretty good stuff if you ask me. Grip safety is investment cast. Yep, it's got the speed bump on it. Depress is easy enough, not too bad, both on the, the Commander one and on this one as well. That's a big issue with me because that's kind of a comfort factor. And no, I don't dig grip safeties. But in a 1911, light single action trigger, they make a lot of sense. Uh, blackened. The fit on the grip safety I think is adequate. Is it to a custom level? 
I don't know, probably not. But again, we get into that linear price versus quality level. Something to think about. Commander style hammer, got no problems with it, nor would I replace it. Maybe it would increase lock time a little bit since it's hollowed out. That takes it to the trigger. A ventilated aluminum shoe trigger, and in my opinion, it's a cost-saving measure on the PD. Not a great trigger. I'm not going to lie to you. That's not awesome. You could probably replace it with something, I don't know, better. Uh, however, I don't find it obnoxious either. It's got a little over-travel stop in there. I didn't even fool that. Some guys will make the case you shouldn't have an over-travel stop in a defensive handgun. If you do, lock tight it. Agreed. Uh, on the pool scale, yes, I finally got one. Five pounds for this 108293. Sadly, Missings is running about just under four pounds with his own trigger job. Yes, he does trigger jobs. I didn't know that either. Blows my mind. I don't know if he's selling them. I'm just saying he did his own. He's like, I'll work that gun over for you if you want nothing fancy. I'm like, I don't know. I kind of like the trigger as it is. Yes, it has a little bit of creep to it before it releases. But in shooting these two guns, I, find, I found I was inadvertently popping rounds with this one. I just wasn't used to the trigger. I mean, we're doing some running gun on plates and bip, bip. I'm like, whoa, I wasn't expecting that. So for a defensive handgun, five pounds ain't bad. On a 1911, I usually like around four and a half, maybe four pounds. I'm still learning, still progressing. That's just where I'm at right now. The mag release is extended, not obnoxious, checkered, uh, not a mimmed part from what they told me. And it's nice. I have no issues at all. Pretty standard in the 1911 world. And that'll take us to the grips. Made by Packmeyer, they're rubber on this version of the 1911. You know, Allen head screws, stainless steel variety. I like the grips. I normally, in a concealed carry role, do not like rubber grips. They grab clothing, they imprint, the shirt will stay on it. I hate them, and I'll replace them with something like Sadly Missing put on here. These, again, are the low-profile brown nails grips. Very thin. He has kind of the smaller hands. That's kind of why he threw those on there. They're nice grips, though. All kinds of grip, grip options if you don't like them. But right now, I have no intentions to replace that. Subject to change. Here comes another deviation from the John Browning formula of the 1911. Full-length guide rod. Wah, wah. You don't need a full-length guide rod on a 1911, nothing fancy. Uh, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Again, it's kind of like the extractor. I don't really care. I just want the gun to be reliable and accurate. And there's plenty of 1911s, by the way, that do not have a guide rod at all. You know, true the John Moses Browning design that are very accurate. So I don't know if a full-length guy rod necessarily makes a gun more accurate. Um, some guys will make a, the case, pro or con, that it makes it harder to disassemble, reassemble. That is a full-length guy rod, and vice versa. Lots of arguments, lots of passionate opinions on both sides. But in my shooting, I found this gun to be relatively, well, not re more than relatively, very accurate and pleasant to shoot. In a scandium frame gun like this, it's actually kind of nice to have just a little bit of steel up front to help perhaps um, reduce muzzle flip. Full length guide rod. And I don't think takedown on this gun is, for a 1911, that big of a deal. There you go, quality and features. I'm moving as fast as I can. But that establishes the value level. You know, if you don't like the parts that I've discussed, and I probably forgot some stuff, I'll annotate it if I did. You know, pay more money. Upgrade it yourself or buy another 1911. But I think for the price point that the PD represents, the overall quality is excellent. Higher than the Taurus PT 1911. I hope I've established that. It really is. The only real issue I have with the gun is the safety catch. It has to be either milled like that or changed out, in my opinion. And that's about the only change I would do to this 1911. There you have it. And that takes us to ergonomics, traction, balance, and feel. The feel on this one, the commander size one, amazing. I think in the concealed carry pro, uh, protocol, the con uh, <coughs> can't speak, I'm getting hoarse. The concealed carry roll, this gun is outstanding. Great choice. Again, all the considerations of 1911 battery of arms applies. Great balance, great feel. I had a harder time hitting with this gun than I did that one. Not just the trigger, but the sighting plane included. I know, it's a training issue. I need to get better. This one... We're talking weight, balance, and feel. Uh, it was almost magical when I was shooting steel. It was. I mean, I was connecting readily with this. It was inspiring confidence. This Smith & Wesson 1911 PD, I mean, I was just having such a good time and really learning to trust the gun. Isn't that an important factor as well? Balance is excellent, just like most full-size 1911s, but it's a scandium frame. Some guys say, well, I don't know if I like the balance of it. I do. I don't mind it. Yes, there's more muzzle rise as you shoot. It takes you know, 
more uh, recovery. And if you're doing a competition, a steel frame is probably your best option anyhow, just like I discussed, 1911 POU. Accuracy and reliability. Here we go. I gotta go quick, always short on time. Accuracy was excellent, but not outstanding. Here's shooting indoors at, I think, impact guns, a couple groupings. They're not really impressive. Shot by me, standing, not from bench. If I was benching it, it would be better. There's a mediocre group, even more so right there. Not too impressive. Not too impressive. Impressive would be every round in that orange circle, in my opinion. And I would expect that. Here's another manoid bad guy target. I call them PP PPGs, paper bad guys. All right, we're getting a little bit more squared away here. This was a time drill as I was shooting against uh, Officer Jared and also... Uh, uh, Derek from Impact Guns. There's eight rounds, so that's a full magazine. Again, I would really like him to be right here. I'm picky, I know. This was this month, by the way, 1210. What happened there? Holy cow, that's embarrassing. I'm not sure. There's a nice group. Not great, nice group. Nice group there, right here. However, check this out. And this is kind of a tendency I noted with the 1911 full size PD. A flyer. Good group, flyer. Then I moved it out to 25 yards. What, man, fancy, you're doing 25 yard testing? I know, it's rare, because I think I suck at 25 yards from the bench. Here we go. Nice group, huh? Decent. That's a 1911 PD-108-293, shooting MagTech FMJs, but the plot thickens. Look at the flyer. I just show you what happens, I don't care. I think it's funny. Was it me, was it the gun? Well, I felt good about my trigger, pull, trigger pulls. I'm kind of thinking it was a gun because it was a trend throughout my shooting. Here's another one. I forget the ammo shooting. It's either a Blazer or perhaps PMC or MagTech FMJs. Great group. Couple flyers. Felt good about my trigger pulls there. I don't know. There's another one. Same model. This gun right here. There's a group right there. Nice group. Flyer. You know, I kind of discount that, to be honest. I think the gun is capable of easily three inches at 25 yards. And in the hands of another shooter, better yet, in the hands of a ransom rest, you probably would have seen that. I'm going to classify the accuracy. On, and by the way, I didn't shoot that for paper. On steel, I did. Uh, did a great. But I would classify it as excellent. Maybe not outstanding. Outstanding for me, a 1911 doing an inch and a half. I don't even know if I can do that as a shooter from the bench. I don't think my eyes are good enough. I need to get glasses or something, I guess. I don't know. I will say the accuracy in practical shooting was outstanding. Outstanding. Great job. Got a cruise. Not nice. going to do... Oh, reliability. Got to talk about that real quick. Uh, pretty much reliable. Not 100% though. Had a couple bobbles with this. I forget which magazines. If I find out, I'll annotate it. It was failures to strip off the last round from the magazine. Well, I'm talking out of, I don't know, 600, 700 rounds shot through this gun. Three times that happened. Okay, there you have it. Not really sure why. And also I saw multiple failures to lock back on the last round. And again, I forget the magazines. Was it the Chip McCormick's? Forget, if I find out, I'll let you know. I saw no fail failures in this one at all. The ammo being used, by the way, was MagTech, I think. And then with Wolf Full Metal Jacket, it hated Wolf. Yeah, there were several jams to fail on Wolf. And I kind of discount that because Wolf is such a, uh, I don't know, low-powered and dirty ammunition, especially for 1911s. It's just kind of a practice ammo. Overall, good reliability. Not going to go over field strip and maintenance. Uh, might make a video on it later. Might not. Uh, I don't think the field strip on a 1911 is super simple. I've always said that. Comparison, I don't know, against uh, FNP, which is like super, super quick. You know, 1911's got some gotchas in the disassembly and reassembly. There's lots of information out there. Should be. It's a hundred year old gun for crying out loud. Maybe one day I'll do a disassembly on it. The maintenance, uh, just like any 1911, you know. Like I said, keep that slide clean on the scanium frame. Just so you don't get some grit in there. Accessories are what they are for all 1911s. There's a plethora of accessories. Talked about how you can put more sights on it. You can change the, change the grips. You know, you don't like the safety catch, change it. You don't like the hammer, change it. Yes, all that stuff costs money. In my book, what you're trying to do is not have to go into that realm and get most of those items with your 1911. And like I said, under quality and features, you're getting that with a PD. Oh, one other thing and hit on the safety is I don't like how easy it is to disengage. I would like to see it more positive. Not, It's not horrible, but several times during, sh during shooting, I engaged the safety and didn't mean to. And I got to where, I, yes, I was riding the safety while I was shooting. I don't like that style, by the way. 
You can change that too. Maybe do some plunger tube work. I don't know, all kinds of accessories. Change it to your heart's content. But I really don't think out of the box the 1911 PDs need much. They don't. Value. I want to say ballpark $930 for the full size on the left. Subject to change. Yes, it's under $1,000, but not by much. And yes, it's more expensive than a lot of other offerings. But you're in the 1911 world, and as of 2010, that's just the way it stands. They're priced high. I know it sucks. A competitive offering, at least against the full size, might be the Springfield PX9116 LP. Light, lightweight operator. Love that gun. Might test it sometime. Two-piece guide rod. Coco Bolo grips, five to six pound trigger, seven round mags, smooth front strap. It's $185 more though at ballpark $1115 for cost versus this one. I forget the price on that one. It's probably about the same. Wilson Combat Ultralight Carry at 33 ounces, also a lightweight full size 1911. Doesn't have a rail, however, that kind of sucks. Lightweight operator does. That one is $3,250 though. Aluminum frame, not scandium. That's $2,320 more. Nice one, custom Kimber Covert 2 at 32 ounces, $1,400 though. Comes in desert tan, 30 lines per inch front strap, crimson trace uh, on the grips, match trigger, match barrel, carry melt. You're getting a lot for that money, but it's $460 more, and it doesn't have a rail. Okay, the thing I'm trying to show you is that there aren't many competitive options in this quality level. Rail, Lightweight frame, full size. Or this one, no rail, lightweight frame. At the price point and what you're getting. The reliability, pretty good. Accuracy, pretty good. Ergonomics, pretty darn good. The Smith & Wesson 1911 PD series is now a favorite in the project. It is not perfect. I think I've honestly identified some shortcomings of the design. But keep in mind the price point you're paying and it dominates a lot of other low cost 1911s out there. And I know some guys are saying, well, you got this low cost 1911, Springfield's got this one. I know, but remember, we're talking a lightweight, particularly full size, this one too, um, either aluminum or scanium frame at this price point. Preferably with a rail on the full size. Good luck hunting. Man, I'm out of time. This is nothing fancy. This has been the 1911 PD review. Did the best I can. Thanks for the support. Go buy one. They're awesome. Oh, by the way, look in annotation where I recommend to buy them. I'll put it up there somewhere during the video. Take care. See ya. Long shot. Your trigger's a lot lighter. Offhand supported. <laughs> Suck. Shorter sight radius, different trigger. A little bit harder for me to hit with. A little harder. Uh, the trigger was lighter and I cooked some off without really being ready. <laughs> I love this gun. You are selling this to me, right? <laughs> Coming right up. <laughs> this gun rocked. You give me another run on it and I'll be dialed in, you know? It's a deal. Smith & Wesson 1911 PD. Duracoated and Black Hawk Coyote Tan by Mission Spec Camo. Love it. Sadly, missing his gun. I'm trying to make him sell it to me. <laughs> he won't. Uh, no.
Love it. A little bit more recoil, but with some practice, easily conquered, easily. Great gun. Round two, Smith & Wesson 1911 PD. Dig in this gun. I gotta make sure I don't push that safety up in my grip. It's the only thing I can actually criticize at this point. Accuracy, reliability, 100%. Here we go. All right. Stand by. There it is. Ah! How many more? Go. I guess I'm empty. Nice! On the left, on the left. On paper, on paper. Thank you. Two more. Hit my safety again. There we go. Long one. Nice. Shoot a left. Good job. Great accuracy. It really is shooting well. I'm very happy with this gun. It's nice. That safety actuates too too easily though. It's very light. I think you can might upgrade the spring mm -hmm. in here. A little bit stiffer. Because I again turned it on. Yeah. During the, the course. Love it. Here, sail the rest out there. Keep filming, I'll film you. What was the time? Show 143. it. 143. One of the best times we've had. Yeah, that's not bad. That's one of the faster times today. It is. Cool. Uh, you probably got three left, something like that. Okay. Set it a little bit low. Just aim at the bottom of the plate, or lower middle. Nice. Shoots very well. Nicely done. I love it. I think the recoil is manageable too. Yeah, very manageable. You would think for a Scandium frame 1911, 33 ounce, it'd be jacking you up. I just don't find that to be the case. No, it is uh, It is a little more aggressive than a steel frame. A little but bit snappier. That's the skateboard tape I put on the front hand, uh, I saw that. trigger guard. That's because I, I put my trig or trigger yeah, finger there. I don't ever have Not my finger up there. Not my offhand. Awesome, that is nice. Sweet. All right, let's see how paper went. Second run, Trench Warfare, 1911 PD. And again, the coach sucks. <laughs> you know, honestly, I got caught. Be headshots. Oh, that's right, I forgot. All right, I'm pretty happy, but the gun is capable of one hole. But again, this is run and gun, it not is. the freaking range. Yeah, we're not from arrest. Yeah, this is heart rate up, run number 10. Yeah. I'm pretty happy with that. The gun is 100%.